using and also Khan Academy, we can use those uh, towards uh, telemedicine and teleeducation and a live demo towards telehealth was given to us uh, right now. So uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we move uh, to the next uh, keynote uh, session that's on Ayushman Bharat. And uh, as uh, you are aware that uh, on the 23rd of September 2018, our Honorable Prime Minister had made the announcement of uh, Ayushman Bharat a program, an initiative, which is uh, the largest healthcare program of the world, having two components in it. One of uh, building 1,50,000 health centers, and the second is the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arugya Yojana, the largest healthcare insurance cover to the people covering almost one-sixth of the population. And uh, so in this uh, section, we are going to be um, sharing with you more into the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arukya Yojana, what this program is, how they, need, uh, how they are ensuring, uh, taking this insurance cover, providing an insurance cover of 5 lakh per family annually and covering almost 10.74 families. That's almost 50 crore uh, uh, population is, which is going to be covered, one-sixth of the population. So more details on that are going to be, for that I would like to request and invite Dr. Dinesh Arora, Director, National Health Agency, India. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just standing in for Dr. Indu Bhushan. He had to leave because he had another, uh, another presentation at the JLN conference. Uh, can I have the PPT on the screen, please? Uh, just one correction. Uh, it's uh, 537 million, and it's 40% of the population, not one-sixth. So I think these numbers can be overwhelming for anybody. And uh, the PMJ has demonstrated not only use of technology, innovation, but at a scale, at a scale which my presentation will just demonstrate. The scheme was launched on 23rd of September. Its implementation is right now in 29 states out of 36 states and UT, three have not signed the MOU so far, and three, four states are in progress, which will be soon implementing this scheme. Can we have the PPT on the screen, please? Thank you so much. Now, when we talk about numbers, even this number can be very overwhelming. 60 million people fall below the poverty line every year due to catastrophic expenses, due to health. And this perhaps slides, tells us the rationale of the world's biggest health insurance, public insurance scheme. Very interesting to see the morbidity pattern as well as the hospitalization pattern of the bottom 40% and the uppermost 40%. For example, the richest 40%, the richest 40% have lesser morbidity than the lowest 40% that's on the left side. But see at the hospitalization rate. The hospitalization rate of the richest 40% is 5.4%. Perhaps little higher than the global average of about 4.5%. But the hospitalization rate of the bottom 40% is roughly 2.4%. Simply means those who actually require health are being marginalized in the supply side system of, of health financing. Now these numbers, five, uh, 537 million is a poor and vulnerable being covered in this scheme. Five lakh rupees, if I convert into dollars, it's about $7,000 per family per year. And mind you, the hospitalization expenses in India is roughly about 170 to 200 dollars per episode. So, if one hospitalization episode is 200 dollars, 7,000 dollars per year per family, and there's no cap on the family size. And the most important part, this scheme is portable. If you are from Chandigarh, I stay in Madhya Pradesh, I go to a hospital in Gujarat, the benefits are seamless cashless, transparent, and portable. And I'll show you live on the dashboard if I have time right now. 
this is the map of India. It is one country, but can represent many countries. Um, this is the way. One difference of this scheme with any predecessor scheme in the country is the flexibility, the cooperative flexibility which this scheme envisages. We have given the freedom of states to choose the mode of implementation. It can be insurance mode. It can be a trust mode. It can be even hybrid mode. They can have up to five lakhs secondary and tertiary packages. They can have even bucketing of secondary and tertiary packages. Even the claims to be given to public hospitals can be different from those given to the private hospitals. The states can increase the package rates based on certain premises. So this scheme has leapfrogged from what in the West is a fee for service to DRGs to a package based. That means if you have a disease or if you have say you have needed cardiac stenting done, it is costing 65,000 rupees, everything inclusive. So there are about 1393 packages which are further getting revised, pruned, updated. We realize it's a work in progress. Perhaps one thing which we are you know, really worked hard is on the IT system. On one single day, there are more than 10 lakh instances working on our IT system. Right from day launch of 23rd September, it has been seamlessly working. And we have the excellent support of the states which have been working with us. Now, this is the ecosystem of Pradhan Mantri Jan Aroge Yojana. Mind you, on the day one, we controlled really 40% of the numbers of the whole health insurance market in the country. And our scheme will determine the ecosystem in which this, the whole platform of health insurance, ob oblique assurance is there. I'm, you know, I, I can see Dr. Satya Narayan sitting here who has been perhaps the chief advisor and without his help, this IT system wouldn't have been actually working all. He's the ex-IT sec ex secretary, government of India, also health secretary and chairman of UIDI Aadhaar. Um, so there are three main players, the beneficiary, the hospital and the payer. Of course, the central part of this scheme is the patient-centric, the beneficiary. All of them connected seamlessly with a single system of IT platform. This has a beneficiary identification system. This system has hospital empanelment. This has transaction manual. This has claims, all linked singularly with the one system platform available to everyone. And of course, the cutting edge lies the Pradhan Mantri Arogya Mitra, the one who receives you at the hospital desk and facilitates you in having treatment. If I start from the beneficiary, it's portable. This scheme is an entitlement-based scheme. From day one, you are eligible for this scheme. So we need to convey to the people, the bottom 40% who are eligible. We had an Ayushman Bharat Devas in Gram Sivraj Day. In all the panchayats in the country, about 6 lakh villages were reached on one day. People were told about their eligibility through ASHAs. We have a multilingual 12 languages call center, a strong 300 seated call center working 24 by 7, 14555 is the number. And a very strong grievance redressal where the outbound calls are made from call center as well as through the mobile app, grievances can be raised as well as the website. One of the most important things here is the fraud prevention. Sorry, I was, I'm trying to see for the laser beam, but it's not working, I think, here. The fraud prevention, quality assurance is the work in progress, which Globally, every insurance, public insurance scheme can be fraught of about to five to six percent. We are aware of this and we have a robust MIS monitoring system along with the top five companies in the world working with us for a proof of concept on detection, prevention and mitigation of frauds. A quality assurance layer is being formed of silver, gold and platinum in association with NABH and Quality Council of India. We have guidelines, benefit packages, capacity building, along with our development partners from World Bank, from GIZ, from ADB, and NSDC, the skill ministry, a robust monitoring and evaluation and fund flow. One thing about fund flow is uh, we have seen the experiences in the past scheme. When we implement any health insurance scheme, the money or the working capital becomes a constraint. 
we have made it a point here as part of our SLA that the payment to the hospitals has to be given in 15 days of discharge. Otherwise, there's a 1% penal interest on the concerned insurance, state or national health agency. And we have been sticking to it by 94%. In fact, in India, the global param the Indian parameter of giving, giving money back to the hospital is about three months. It was roughly at times six months in RSBY. In PMJY, we monitor it within 15 days up to 94% payments have been given. So this is how our system has been put on. There's a beneficiary identification system, which is demographic and biometric based, based on Aadhaar. There's a simple registration process for the hospitals and the transaction management system. We were in fact having our own data privacy policy, security policy with more than 100 controls. And every day it is being monitored at the highest level. Little complicated slide, but just wanted to show you how things work on the field. We have our PMJ website, which can access, beneficiaries can access. There is a mira.pmj.gov.in. It has data of about 537 million people. You can check simply by your mobile or the website where you can put your name, uh, son of or daughter of, village parameters, and you can see whether you are part of the scheme or not. If you are part of the scheme, you can just simply go to the hospital, use your biometric thumb or iris and avail treatment whenever required. Now that's, that's called beneficiary identification system. We have hospital empanelment, HEM, transaction management system, insights platform. Perhaps the next slides will show you us how we monitor things and the grievance redressal. And these are the three beneficiaries, hospitals and the state health agencies, the insurance or the third party administrators who work in tandem on one IT system. It's just a Mira PMG dot interface where you can just check whether you're eligible or not. This is the mobile app interface. We have launched about two weeks back, already uh, 0.1 million or one lakh hits have already happened. In this, we have a first thing is nearby hospitals. It writes over Google. You switch it on, switch on your location. You will come to know what are the nearest empaneled hospitals, what specialties they have, how much distance it will take to you to reach that hospital, and what is the best route to reach. It also has the check eligibility, get help to the call center, FAQs, and read more about the literature of uh, Ayushman Bharat PMJY. And very soon, this app will have a grievance redressal module also, and a satisfaction module. This is our PMJ dashboard, or we call it CEO's dashboard, where our CEO, Dr. Indu Bhushan, reviews this every day in the morning with the whole team. We can drill down to every hospital using this dashboard. So there are about nine dashboards, the operation dashboards, hospital empanelment, pre-authorization, like those procedures which require pre-authorization, how many have been done, in what time slot they have been done, how have been auto-approved. One of the very good dashboards is a portability dashboard. If given a choice, I'd just like to show you how the portability dashboard works. District dashboards, operation dashboard at the district level. Honorable Prime Minister has written personalized letter to nearly 7.8 crores, 78 million beneficiaries. And that is being tracked through this. Most of them have been delivered. The hospital list and some state demographics. Let's create a small uh, snapshot of how the dashboard looks. The first one are the beneficiaries verified. We call them verified through Aadhaar. They have been issued a e-card, which we called as golden record. So as of now, 20 million have been issued in last, 20 million have been issued in last five months. And since morning today, 2.68 lakhs have been issued. Now this is something called scale, which normally India works at. The next is a pre-authorization number. How many people are taking treatment? It's about, it has already gone, 1.3 million people have taken treatment in the last five months. Today, 12,775. I think this is a less yesterday's snapshot. Maybe, Varun, can you show us a live dashboard also? You can do it from there. Okay. Maybe after the presentation, just show it. Um, and then we have the pre-authorization amount. The, the right second one is what I wanted to show you. If the total amount is 1778 crores, 
only 112 crore is pending beyond SLA, pending beyond 15 days. The rest has been cleared. The two round columns behind are one is if the beneficiaries are verified, how many have been verified using Aadhaar? I'm sure most of us are aware of Aadhaar, the unique India's largest dio, uh, demographic unique identification started by Dr. Nandan Nilkeni and carried on by Dr. Satya. We also have the hospital and panels. So 14,703 hospitals and panels in the scheme with about 51% in the public sector and 49% in the private sector. You can have through all states going through number of claims as well as specialties. For example, the right column down, what are the top five tertiary specialties which have been most commonly used? Understandingly, medical oncology, cardiology, ortho, urology, and radiation oncology. This is one of the dashboards which we monitor every day in and out. All the state CEOs have this, district collectors have this, and this is how we seamlessly monitor with each other. In fact, uh, one thing I just wanted to show here. Is this screen going forward? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you play the video? Pradhan Mantri Narendra Modi ne Bharat ko Ayushman banane ka abhi sankalp hi uthaya ki jan jan ka kaya kalp hone laga. Yojna shuru hone ke thode se samay mein jo hua, uski kalpana bhi kabhi kisi ne na ki hogi. Har ghar paribar ko swasthe ka vardhan mil raha hai. Bharat Ayushman ho raha hai. My name is Ghansam Prasad and we are from Hazari Bagh, Jharkhand. My brother had an operation, he had a heart problem. He had a half a lakh estimate. In the same time, Asman Bharat announced the Pradhan Mantri Ji. After the AIMS, we didn't have a lot of money. We are doing free treatment. I am from Nandanabad, Purdi, Jila Dabariya, State of UP. My wife had a heart problem. डॉक्टर ने हमें एक लाख पचास हजार रुपये फीस मांगा था मैं आरोग्य मित्र से मिला और उन्होंने गोल्डन कार्ड मुझे इशू कराया और जब मैं दिखाया डॉक्टर को तो कहा कि अब आपके ये पैसे नहीं लगेंगे इस योजना का तथा आप पंजीकृत हो गए मेरा नाम हबीब खान है मैं एमपी के सागर शहर से आया हूँ और मेरे भतीजे का हार्ड का ऑपरेशन होना है मैं तो किसान हूँ और मेरे भैया है जिनका लड़का है वो मजदूरी करते हैं उनकी आय बहुत ही कम है अगर ये योजना नहीं होती तो मेरे लिए ऑपरेशन करवाना मुश्किल था या तो कर्ज लेना पड़ता या ऑपरेशन ही नहीं होता नाम मेरा प्यारे लाल और लड़के का नाम है अजीत सिंह जिला बुलंदशहर है तो वो इतना फायदा हुआ कि साठ सत्तर हजार रुपए जो इन्हें भी मांगे ऑपरेशन के वहाँ में वो फायदा है वो यहाँ सब बहुत सुविधा मिल रही है दवा दोनों टाइम दे रहे हैं और खानों भी आ रहे हैं मेरे लिए तो ईश्वर रुपये आए मोदी जी और भी योजना ये एक सफल शुरुआत है अच्छे स्वास्थ्य की सबको मिलनी सौगात है लाखों परिवार को मिला करोड़ों को मिलना मुफ्त उपचार है अब बीमार और नहीं लाचार है आयुष्मान भारत हो भारत आयुष्मान हो आयुष्मान हो थैंक यू सो मच लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन must concede that it's just a beginning. Uh, if the aim is to decrease catastrophic expenses and not let those 60 million people go below the poverty line, uh, I think it's just a beginning. And if we implement this scheme well, it will give results. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for giving us a comprehensive account of uh, PMJ. And uh, as the name says, Ayushman Bharat, long live Bharat. This uh, scheme uh, actually delivering on the safety, the efficiency, the quality of healthcare, and taking it to the masses. Uh, the other component uh, of the Ayushman Bharat is uh, the creation of 1,50,000 uh, health and wellness centers. More information on that we have from uh, Dr. Rajni Vaid, whom I would now like to invite, the Executive Director of the Na National Health uh, System Resource Center. 
Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's rather comical to begin uh, an address with a kind of a disclaimer. Uh, you were to have the additional secretary and mission director of the National Health Mission, Mr. Manoj Jalani, here, but I guess he's been called away on some urgent work. Um, and therefore, I'm to give this presentation. What I'm going to talk about as a, as a person who works in a boundary organization that supports implementation, and our work this past year has been focusing on the primary healthcare component of Ayushman Bharat, which you all popularly know, know as the health and wellness centers. Um, so the commitment is to scale up the transformation of 150,000 sub-health centers and primary health centers to health and wellness centers. Um, those of you who are familiar with the health sector know that the health sub-health center works at a population of 5,000 or 3,000 in hilly areas, 30,000 in rural areas, and about 50,000 in urban primary health centers. Um, the presentation that you just heard before from Dr. Aurora told you about the hospitalization component and secondary and tertiary care provision. The primary health care delivery through health and wellness centers actually entails a lot of policy and programmatic shifts. And one of the biggest shifts is the introduction of digital health at every level of these health and wellness centers. So I'm going to talk to you very briefly about a few components. I'm sorry, I don't have a presentation because I wasn't expecting to be here till about half an hour ago. Uh, but I'm going to speak to you about a few of the digital health components that we are envisaging. Some of them are already out on the ground. Um, primary health care is by no means new to India. For 70 years, we have been delivering primary health care, but this has been largely selective primary health care. We focused on reproductive and child health indicators, which really have been the areas of concern for us for a long time. But in the last two decades, India has been faced with the epidemiological burden of non-communicable diseases, and therefore the challenge is on how to integrate a package that has reproductive child health, which has a certain uh, population subgroup, and also add on non-communicable diseases, which really has a large population over 30 years of age. So we've been working on something called an RC, reproductive and child health portal, in which frontline workers have a tablet in which they enter data that allows them to track mothers and children. But it's a very far cry from tracking mothers and children to being able to track the entire population for the provision of several packages of primary health care. And so one of the newest ones, and I don't know if there's going to be an opportunity here at any of the other sessions to present something we call a non-communicable disease application that actually initiates from the lowest level of health worker, which is the ASHA, uh, the community health worker, who's been given a smartphone that allows her to do population-based enrollment, that allows her to uh, undertake risk assessment for those who are at risk for any of the non-communicable diseases, on to the next level of worker who shares the data and is able to provide some level of screening, and then to the medical officer who starts the treatment plan. Obviously, this requires a seamless continuum of care, and unless we have this, there is really, it is very difficult for us to uh, engage in any kind of management of non-communicable diseases. Currently, the way non-communicable diseases are managed are people walk into facilities, they get diagnosed with either hypertension or diabetes, they are started on treatment, but there's no telling where they have to go back for treatment, when they have to go back for treatment, and if they get lost to follow up. And therefore, the introduction of a digital health platform, particularly the NCD app, we believe is going to help us transform the way we address non-communicable diseases. And the commonest of those, of course, are hypertension and diabetes, but we're also looking at epilepsy, we're looking at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and some common cancers. Um, the second, the RCH portal is already in operation in many states, but of course our challenge now is to make the RCH portal, which was developed earlier, to talk to the NCD portal, which, or NCD app, which has just been developed. We also have several applications for programs like diabetes, for uh, tuberculosis, for leprosy, for other communicable diseases, and primary health care means that we have to address all of these conditions at the health and wellness centers levels, and therefore, ensuring that there is a common language between all of these applications really is the big challenge that we face. The second application that we see for digital health is the use of telemedicine, teleradiology, and teleophthalmology. We have a lot of experience with this. There is a National Medical College network 
but the use of the telemedicine in telementoring is something that we're exploring with. Uh, there are platforms that are set up at the lowest level of facility so that the service provider there can consult with specialists in medical colleges or district hospitals to be able to provide care for conditions so that patients don't have to travel too far. Another application that is, in, is being thought about is the use of artificial intelligence, particularly in addressing conditions related to myocardial infarctions. So there is a venture on in Tamil Nadu and Goa called STEMI, which looks at different patterns of myocardial infarction and is able to transmit those to lower level providers so that even at the spokes where they can refer and stabilize the patients, the use of machine learning tools is helping. But this is all very new, not yet evolved and not yet scaled up. Um, another platform that we are looking or another intervention has got to be personal health records which will empower citizens to not just access their own data but also to be able to say get send them messages related to tobacco cessation and lifestyle modification. The entire health and wellness center effort is only about a year old and perhaps the most mature of the digital health applications are the reproductive child health application and the newly launched NCD application. We also have a dashboard. I wish I had been able to show it to you the way Dr. Arora's impressive presentation was, but that tells us almost on a daily basis the way the health and wellness centers are being operationalized. So we know now how many health and wellness centers in the country. Our target is 15,000 for March of this year. How many of them have human resources? How many of them have the infrastructure? how many of them are branded as health and wellness centers, and whether NCD screening has actually begun. So, you know, I don't have very much more to say, but I'm happy to take questions related to the primary health care component, because this really wasn't very, very well articulated in the media, and people's understanding of all of the primary health care, it is a very complex subject, and their own understanding of this is slightly limited, so I'm happy to take questions, because I wouldn't have very much more to share at this point. So. I'm sorry about this, but <laughs> if there are any questions, I'm happy to take it now because I do have the time. It's all right? Okay. Sorry, it's going to be. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for sharing us, uh, with us the information about uh, the Health and Wellness Center centers under the Aishman Bharat. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we move to the next session. This is a plenary session. Just to let you know that we've already started with our breakaway sessions and the roundtable uh, discussions, which are on the second floor. This is a session on futuristic health systems, an overview of the landscape of digital health intervention. And joining us uh, in this uh, session, ladies and gentlemen, are very eminent uh, healthcare experts and think tank and policy makers who are going to be sharing in uh, their vision and their approach. Uh, I would like to invite first the chair of the session, Mr. Amitav Kant, the CEO of uh, Niti Aayog. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Niti Aayog is a think tank body of the government of India, catalyzing uh, towards economic development. And Mr. Kant, uh, ladies and gentlemen, himself has been a transformist, a reformist, uh, various interventions which he has been taking. In fact, he is known as a man of reforms and a man of uh, many transformative ideas. It's a pleasure, honor to have him here and invite him here as the chair of the session. Our co-chair of the session, Dr. Dawn Rucker, the National Coordinator for Health IT from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, USA. Our eminent speakers, Mr. Amandeep Gill, the Executive Director, UN High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. He's going to be, uh, we are going to be connecting with him uh, live uh, through a video conferencing from Geneva. Mr. Bernardo Mariano, the Chief Information Officer, WHO Switzerland. May I request you, sir, to please grace the days. Dr. Devi Shetty, the Chairman and Executive Director, Narayana Health India. Mr. Hal Wolf, the President and the Chief Executive Officer of HIMSS USA. Inviting Mr. John Quackenbush as the eminent speaker, joining us from Harvard Chan School of Public Health USA. Professor Kazim Rahimi, Director, Oxford Martin Program on Deep Medicine, United Kingdom. 
and Professor Sunil Agrawal, Director, Robotics in Rehabilitation Laboratory, University of Columbia, New York. So once again, welcome to all the dignitaries, and I would like to request uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan, the chair of the session, for his opening remarks, and then the further proceedings. Thank you, sir. Uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have a very, very a uh, distinguished panel. Uh, we have uh, the co-chair, Dr. Don Rucker, who is the National Coordinator for Health IT, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the United States of America. We have John Quackerbush, Mr. Devi Shetty, Mr. Hai Wolf, Mr. Sunil Agarwal, and Mr. Kizam Rahimi, all very, very distinguished people, ladies and gentlemen. You couldn't have had a better panel than this to drive uh, the digital, International Digital Health Symposium and to discuss on the futuristic health systems and to give you a broad overview of the landscape of digital health interventions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, Rudyard Kipling who had once remarked that what do they know of England who only England know? In the 21st century, this aphorism could be replaced thus. What do they know of healthcare who only medicine know? 21st century is the age of informatics. Today's doctor, to my mind, needs to be well versed in the basics of information technology as he, she is an anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology. No man is an island unto himself. Information technology should necessarily be an integral part of any modern healthcare system. New healthcare models initiated by the IT companies while delivering quality care will explore the possibility of innovative new technologies that are simple to use cost-effective, portable, and power-independent. But there are challenges in integrating IT into the healthcare system across the world, and particularly in India. The diabetic capital of the world is dealing with multiple lifestyle diseases like TB, cancer, kidney disease-related issues. India is home to 104 million elderly people. If we enhance our capabilities in data analytics and artificial intelligence, there are possibilities of finding solution to many of these challenges. To my mind, there are two major challenges that technology can possibly solve in healthcare in India. We in India suffer from severe lack of doctors specialists, and on the human resources side in the medical care. And secondly, to my mind, because I'm implementing the aspirational district program, which deals with the backward districts of India, doctors are just not willing to go in remote areas. How do we solve these challenges? To my mind, by using telemedicine technology, Doctors, one of the main challenges that we are confronted with is as patients in primary health care center look for specialists and specialists are just not available at village level, we are linking up primary health care centers to the district hospitals. And 150,000 primary health care centers will get linked up to the district hospitals digitally. The second is that India is rolling out, has just rolled out the Ayushman Bharat scheme for 500 million Indians. And 500 million Indians means 
that you're talking about a population which is bigger than the population of United States of America, Europe, and Mexico put together. We are providing 500,000 rupees insurance to 500 million Indians, which is the biggest insurance scheme across the world. By linking up digitally 150,000 primary health care centers and by this insurance scheme for 500 million Indians, you're going to throw up the kind of data which the world has never seen before. This will be phenomenal amount of data relating to health of Indians, the size and scale of which cannot be imagined. Data truly is the new oxygen, and therefore, it provides you the opportunity to do a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we can provide care to the poorest of the poor people living in the remotest corners of India by the use of artificial intelligence and by the use of technology. And therefore, my view is, that much like we have technologically leapfrogged digitally in many areas, we're the only country in the world with has a billion biometrics. No other country has a billion biometrics. We're the only country in the world with a billion mobile and only country in the world with a billion bank accounts. Our goods and services tax is totally digital. 99% of Indians pay direct tax digitally. And similarly, the Aishman Bharat Scheme is paperless, cashless, and digital. And therefore, India provides a unique opportunity to technologically leapfrog in the healthcare system. And to my mind, the big experts here, this panel of the most distinguished people in the world, will provide, will raise some of these issues. They will provide solutions to many of these challenges. And they will tell us how the world is grappling with many of these challenges, because they are the most learned people in the world dealing with technology and health. And therefore, I turn to my co-chair, the very distinguished Mr. Don Rekha, to take over the floor and kindly moderate, uh, kindly moderate this session. Dr. Don Rekha is one of the most distinguished people. He's the National Coordinator for Health IT, and he will shed light on many of these challenges. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. All right, All right. thank you, Mr. Khan. Um, very impressive vision. So I think uh, each of the panelists is going to bring um, their view of some of the extraordinary technologies that we have in the future. So let me set off with uh, some of the things that we're enabling in the United States, especially from the government point of view. So for folks who are not familiar with the American healthcare system, we are starting from a somewhat different point, obviously, than other folks. And so we have a lot of electronic medical records built out, some based on very old database technology going back literally 50 years. And the will of the Congress of the United States and the will of um, the President of the United States is that the American public actually starts being in control of their health care and in control of their health care data. So the vision of technology that we're talking about is moving control from the hospitals and the doctors and their electronic medical record systems this will be very gradual, unfortunately, over to patients and their smartphones. Um, and once we have that, then we will have, as, as pretty much every speaker has mentioned, a universal platform to build an entire ecosystem of new technologies on top of that platform using the patient's medical information the patient's mobility information, any other information the patient wants to release from their smartphone to fuel that global integrated health. And in the United States, very importantly, to actually empower the patient to take care of themselves. In the US, because we've had a lot of third-party payment systems, 
patients are sort of used to somebody else taking care of themselves and not thinking about their medical care. So once it's on the smartphone, there's an intimacy and an immediacy that we think is going to change things. There are two specific areas that we want to call out as facilitating this modern environment. Um, one is the increasing use of standards that we have been working on here with the affiliated um, Global Digital Health Partnership uh, that um, we've had uh, Tim Kelsey in Australia have led and the Joint Secretary is uh, going to be the Secretariat going forward to have international standards or more harmonization of international standards. So anybody developing software for smartphones is going to be able to use those standards and be creative about what they do and spending all of their time on basic connectivity issues. That really is where we need to move in efficiency. The other thing, which maybe is more uniquely um, in the United States, but I'm guessing not totally, is how do we release the data from the electronic medical records where it sits today? And while this has been able to be done on some level in technology and computing in the past, um, the US Congress and President Obama, and this is something President Trump also strongly believes in, is facilitating, as we have passed a law um, and our agency has just issued regulations that patients are going to be able to access data through the modern fire interface standards. Mr. Graham Grieve from Australia, who's sitting at the middle table. Uh, Graham, maybe if you could stand up as opposed to waving your hand. Um, uh, um, it has uh, worked with uh, folks internationally to uh, help design this, to free this data. Uh, this is part of the modern software, the RESTful stack of communications, the JSON, JavaScript object notation stack of data flow, and the FIRE stack of healthcare personalization in JSON. So obviously I'm summarizing a lot of technology. That's what is going to empower a smartphone-enabled world throughout the planet. Um, that combination of technology, of standards, and frankly in the U.S. of uh, regulatory um, incentives through our payment system. Administrator Seema Verma has been uh, leading the way on that along with uh, the White House President Trump and Secretary Azar. The last thing I want to talk about, so I went into um, medical computing after doing a residency. And you know, I did my residency in the very early 1980s. So that was a while ago. Probably most of you weren't born. Um, but um, I went into computing because I was wasting a lot of time doing stupid things and paperwork. I remember one time, not one time, every day in our hospital, which was a esteemed teaching hospital, we had to go through every single patient's microbiology culture results to find our patient's results because they weren't alphabetized. If you can imagine that. Um, so not even not computerized, not alphabetized. And the alphabet was around in 1984, I absolutely assure you. So we need to think to take that primitive labor-intensive thing, and I think healthcare is labor-intensive everywhere that I'm familiar with, and think about computerizing that and automating that. And these new application program interface technology and the entire internet of things, right? Every device has an IP address. So we are at the brink of a way of computerizing and integrating all of these instruments in a much more seamless, in a much more real-time way. So that's the vision that we're working towards in the United States from a, a governmental point of view, and, and many in America working from an entrepreneurial point of view. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Mr. Amandeep Gill, who is on video. So if we can tee up the video. Uh, Mr. Gill is the UN high-level panel on digital cooperation. And I saw him on video before. So can we get the video of the next speaker?
Nobody said real time was easy. There we go. Mr. Gill. Thank you very much uh, to the two co-chairs uh, for introducing this panel and uh, uh, my uh, sincerest gratitude to uh, Lava Agarwal and his team, uh, the Secretary Health and the Honorable Minister for putting this together and for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts on behalf of uh, the Secretary General's high-level panel co-chaired by Melinda Gates and uh, Jack Ma. In the morning, uh, you, you have heard excellent examples of how digital technologies uh, can uh, re-energize uh, healthcare delivery uh, through telemedicine, uh, through personalized uh, uh, patient care, through electronic uh, health uh, records, uh, and the data that can be aggregated and then used to drive uh, uh, systems uh, uh, decision support uh, systems and patient care uh, systems. I want to focus a little bit on the non-technology related aspects of these issues, the policy aspects of these issues. Uh, for example, there is uh, the challenge of delivering low cost health care uh, to all those, to, to, uh, those who are not served by the existing uh, systems. This is a challenge in India this is a challenge in most of the developing uh, world. And digital technologies can help us to scale healthcare delivery uh, and uh, deliver uh, uh, healthcare solutions uh, to uh, patients that have not been served well by the existing uh, systems. In the panel's discussions with governments around the world, with different stakeholders, uh, with CEOs of companies, with civil society, we've come uh, uh, to the conclusion that the international community needs to rally around the following seven action points. And I would like to share them with you and uh, 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 hope for some discussion around uh, a few of those. Number one, there is a need to move away from tools and solutions for single diseases, uh, for example, fixed malaria or fixed tuberculosis, to solutions that help improve the whole healthcare system and ensure that benefits are equitable across the population. Uh, second, there is a need for national governments to ensure that digital is an integral part of the national health strategy and the national healthcare system. So treating digital as a horizontal capability, not as solutions for a particular uh, problem. Third, using technology, using digital uh, tools in a way that empowers both the patient, and Dr. Tucker, you spoke about that, but also the healthcare worker. So if the ASHA at the end of the chain does not feel empowered with the tablet in her hands, then we are missing something in the use of uh, technology. So empowering community healthcare workers, connecting them with the center, uh, with the doctors who in, in uh, higher level care centers, that's an essential part of uh, our uh, thinking. Uh, fourth, we need to create a sense of urgency and incentives to foster cross sectoral collaborations. Uh, Dr. Amit Abkant mentioned how uh, health today is not only about medicine uh, and our, how health data is increasingly all kinds of data. So we need cross-sectoral collaborations around uh, the big challenges of today, non-communicable diseases, uh, the uh, burden of diabetes, for example. And then at the international level, we need a global framework uh, for regulation, for bringing in ethical approaches into management of uh, patient health data, for example. Uh, we need a global framework for collaboration around data. So incentives for countries across the globe to share data so that they, that data can be used to drive global uh, solutions. We also need common standards. Uh, and I'm glad that there was a mention of some of these standards. There is still too much fragmentation in terms of the softwares that are used across hospitals. 30 plus softwares in most hospitals uh, in the world. 
uh, and uh, there is still fragmentation in terms of interoperability uh, and uh, common standards. So uh, we should drive uh, that uh, uh, harmonization process uh, in a strategic uh, uh, sense. Then uh, I think the most important insight that I want to share today from the panel's perspective uh, is that we need some moonshots. We need one or two global projects uh, that help governments across the world sit up and take notice of the power of digital in health systems. These moonshots could be around issues such as mental health, Alzheimer's, for example. These are relatively less uh, controversial uh, in regard to sharing of data. Uh, there is a, a less uh, uh, commercial uh, competition in some of these uh, spaces. So if we can build a system that sits perhaps in the WHO, where uh, a set of data points, nine to 10 data points, uh, can be used across the globe to aggregate data, and then the analytics are done at uh, 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 through a partnership, public-private partnership, that's global, that's inclusive, and then the results are shared uh, across the globe as a public good. That would uh, help uh, us take the discussion to the next level. So I want to conclude by thanking the organizers once again and appreciating the immense work that India is doing with uh, these schemes and with the, uh, the, uh, the health stack built on Aadhaar. These are models uh, that can be replicated uh, across the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Director, Director Gill. Gill. Next, Next, we have we Mr. Have Bernardo Mariano, Chief Information Officer from the World Health Organization. Thank you. When I, when I mentioned to my son that um, I was coming to this conference talking about uh, digital health, and he told me that he had a dream. The dream was that uh, he found uh, two ATMs. One ATM was the automatic teller machine, but the other one was automatic telemedicine machine. All to say that uh, in digital health, when you look about, when you think about the future of digital health, what we might think that uh, today is like a dream. But if you think, if you look at the technologies that we have, those technologies are actually making that dream a possibility. Let's let's look at the disruptive technologies that uh, that digitize a number of uh, other areas of business, such as photography. You all remember photography when it was used to be in paper, used to be a privilege of some. Today, everyone can take pictures. Think about the media. Today, anyone can be, can basically broadcast. That's a revolution. That's digital. Let's think about accommodation and hotels. Today, anyone can actually run a little hotel. What is common in all these changes where digital came into revol to revol revolutionize those industry is that the power was given to the users. So people were empowered. When you think, when you talk about health, of course, that empowerment, we want it to not to be like the, the fake news in media empowerment. So therefore, at WHO, we'll, we'll want to look at it from with the tr triple A and the triple P's. Let me talk, talk about the triple A's and the triple P's. One A is the appropriateness. In appropriateness, we want to make sure that there's good governance, the safe use, and there's ethical use of digital health technology. The second A is accessibility. Let's not forget about universal health care coverage. Let's not forget about the Sustainable Development Goal number three, health 
for all. When you talk about affordability, let's not forget about the, top, the bottom billion people, the most poor, that we want to make sure that this technology is affordable to, to them. We want to make sure that it's not just intellectual property. And as we move and we look at uh, how technology can change the way we interact, let me talk about the triple piece. The first P is people. The second P is people. And the third P is people as well. Because health has a central is, is central to oh, health is central to the well-being of the people, and we we as individuals have to make sure that as we talk about technology, at the end of the line, there is a person that will be impacted by whatever decision and whatever tool and whatever methodology that we put forward to make sure that. The, that impact has, is a positive health outcome, has a positive health outcome and not a negative one. So therefore, as we, in the NWHO, as we look at, uh, at the world entering its fourth industrial revolution or health 4.0, Let's, let's, let's remind ourselves that uh, we must not forget that 49% of the population are still not connected to broadband. We have 7,000 rare diseases affecting 350 million people. And we have 1 billion people that are still affected by neglected tropical diseases. At WHO, leave, leaving no one behind is enshrined in our DNA and is an intrinsic part, intrinsic part of uh, health and well-being for all. So therefore, universal health coverage, sustainable development goal, and not for, let's, not, not, let's not leave no one behind at the key elements that we want to make sure that uh, as we embrace the journey of digital health. We not, do not forget that people are at the center of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mariano, well-spoken. Now we have Dr. Devi Shetty, Chairman and Executive Director of Narayana Health in India. Sorry, I'm just trying to connect my mobile phone. Yep. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers for giving me the opportunity. I'm not going to talk about the uh, future of healthcare. I'm going to talk about current state of healthcare in India, how it is delivered. 
We believe that India will be at the forefront of digital transformation of delivering healthcare. And we believe that all the electronic medical records of the world will get shifted from the desktop to the tablet and the mobile phone. Why mobile phone? Because doctors look at the desktop five to 10 times in a day, and they look at their mobile phone 200 times in a day. And we believe that any technology addressing the doctors for using the electronic medical record cannot have a keyboard because God did not create the doctors to type. And I'll just give an example of what we are doing currently in uh, using the mobile phone in delivering healthcare. We have 70 million diabetics and 600 diabetologists in the country. So normally a diabetic patient sees the diabetologist uh, about once a month or twice a month. We want the diabetologist to see the, his patient once a year. So a patient comes to us, right? We run a fairly large system of healthcare. About 14% 14, 14 of the heart surgery done in India is done by us. For you to understand what that size is, whole of National Health Service of United Kingdom does 30,000 heart surgeries a year. And last year, we did 17,000 heart surgeries. So it's a very large number. So we have a huge number of patients. We have about 55,000 patients registered by us in our system with diabetes only in the last one year. And 3,000 of them are currently managed online. We, when the patient comes to the hospital, we have a electronic medical record to monitor them called Cura, which is created by uh, our company based in US. And it is built on a mobile platform on an iPad. And we have all the data of these patients. And that Cura is connected to Kaizala, which is a platform created by Microsoft. Why Kaizala? Kaizala is because Kaizala is the only HIPAA compliant uh, application where groups can get together and chat. Healthcare is never a one-man affair. Healthcare is always delivered by a group of 10, 20 people per patient. So unless all the group is together, you can never be involved in the healthcare. So I'll just give an example of NH online diabetic uh, uh, the, the clinic. So this is how it runs. All the patients, we educate them to download a Kaizala app, and they go home, and whenever the blood sugar goes up and down, they can contact the nurse or record the glucometer. All they have to do is to uh, enter the 27th of February, they should write the figure, whatever their, their blood sugar is, whether it's 120 or 140, whatever it is. In the end, once it is done, they can send the report and they get an automatic report and if the sugar is okay it's fine otherwise the the diabetic counselor talking to the doctor will send a message because they have all the data about what medicine patient is on and they advise a patient and in the last three months we have noticed 20 percent reduction in the glycosylated hemoglobin with the, uh, online diabetic management so the, this is about one application we built on Kaizala. The second application is an application of managing patients in the post-op cardiac ICU. We do about, in one hospital, we do about 37 heart surgeries a day. So we have a large number of patients in the ICU. We cannot have that many intensivists looking after the patient at night. So, Typically what happens, this is a patient who had a pulmonary endarterectomy. There are 20 of us taking care of the patient. Every few minutes, patient data comes to our phone. All 20 of us can see it. It is HIPAA compliant, it is secure. Like this is the x-ray you can see. 
of the patient which was done in the morning across the world, whether it's US or Europe, when an X-ray is done, it goes to the hospital management system, and if a doctor wants to see it, first he has to put his ID, then he has to put the patient MRN number, which is a 10-digit number. It takes minimum 15, 15 minutes. So across the world, no doctor sees the X-ray after the heart operation unless patient is unwell. Whereas here, we get the data right away. I can expand it. I can, I can get whatever data I want. I can keep communicating. The moment I saw the cardiac monitor, patient is in atrial fibrillation. Then I sent a message, how long the patient has been in atrial fibrillation. So they said last 48 hours he is going in and out of the atrial fibrillation. So I can see the ventilator, I can see the blood gas report, I can see any chart, input output chart, anything I want, I can see it. Today, sitting in a plane, landing in Miami airport, I do the ICU rounds. And 11 o'clock I go to bed, before going to bed, I see all my patients and I get the real-time data. I send the blood sample to the laboratory. The moment machine analyzes sin, the moment he does it real-time, it comes to 20 phones. So there is no delay in taking care of the patient. And this will have an immense impact on the outcome because every hospital does everything what is required for the patient. But they do it after one hour or two hours of delay. By getting the real-time data into your mobile phone, you can take necessary call. So essentially, the way we look at healthcare will undergo dramatic change. The, I'll just give an example. We believe that every patient who has a history of medical illness should have his medical record in their own phone. So Kaizala has a folder, as a, this is me, my phone, and my medical records are here. I had a uh, dental procedure, it is the MRI of temperamental joint, MRI NLS, all my data is in my phone. And if, I, if any patient wants to communicate with the doctor, Kaizala has the Skype connection and I can talk to the patient and the most comforting thing for the doctor, we, in India we have been talking about uh, telemedicine 17 years ago. But it didn't become popular because no doctor is comfortable talking to the patient unless he has entire patient medical data. And today, with the applications like Kaizala, we can transfer data from any part of the world to any other part of the world. So as I am talking on a video conference, I can see the entire data. And this will have a game-changing effect. We have a health city in Cayman Island. Our, our desire is to cover the entire Caribbean population from one hospital in Cayman Island. How is it possible? Caribbean region is very interesting because they have 42 million people living there, and some of the islands have 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 people. No diabetologists, no nephrologists want to live in those islands. So our desire is that entire 40 million people if they can have an application like Kaizala in their mobile phone with their medical records, they can, with the click of a button, they can teach, reach out to our doctors in Cayman Island, and only for the procedure they can uh, go to the hospital. So essentially, everything what we pursue as the way healthcare is delivered will undergo dramatic change. In the next five to 10 years time, believe me, so smart software will make smarter diagnosis than doctors. It will become legally mandatory for us doctors to take the second opinion from the software before starting the treatment. And half our outpatients will disappear because patient will see the doctors online. This is the reality. That means we have to relook at how the hospitals are built. So essentially, all these technologies can be developed at fraction of the price. I'm not only talking about the, the way the healthcare is delivered. I'll just show you the platform we developed with the Microsoft. It's called Power BI, in which I can I get the data on everything. If you want to know how much money I spend 
all our doctors spend for different operation, I can give the breakup. If you want to know how much antibiotic we use following a bypass grafting, I can give you the data. If you want to know the mortality, morbidity, what percent, how many patients receive blood transfusion, any data you want in healthcare, we can provide. We can provide the data on which taluka or which panchayat, two million patient who came to our hospital last year. We believe, we believe in God, but for everything else, we need data. And we want this entire technology to be available to every hospital on the planet just by paying the price of one disposable plastic syringe. That is a pricing. Because as hospital managers, when we do the pricing of a product, we never look at the price of a disposable plastic syringe. And this is possible. When you convert atoms into bytes, amazing things happen. We built the software for our use. I paid for it. I can give this to any hospital on the planet free of cost because I have converted the atoms into bytes. So this is the beauty of how technology will dramatically change the way healthcare is delivered. And I believe all these technologies will be developed in India because we are blessed with phenomenally skilled, extremely talented, passionate software engineers, and they are willing to slog for 24 hours and make this happen. And we are truly blessed uh, in having such a wonderful group of people. And I am showing off today what they have done, and I'm extremely grateful to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shetty. Our next speaker is Hal Wolf, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Healthcare Information Management System Society, uh, known as HIMS. Hal. Thank you, Don. Can you hear me? Are we good? Great. Um, good afternoon. So, um, first of all, it's just an honor to be here. This is the subject matter that's very near and dear to my heart over my last 15 years in healthcare, working in designing systems from clinical decision support to finding the back end solutions to support physicians as well as clinicians and individuals around any healthcare system's ability to simply get the best health possible, no matter where they are. And the reality is, is that all of our systems are facing some very critical challenges. And I want to just make sure we do not walk away without understanding those fundamental drivers. Every healthcare system in the globe has reached a point where the aging population is now beginning to put its ultimate strain on the systems that we have. These aging populations are going to crescendo over the next five to 10 years. And sitting behind them is an increased disease burden. And that disease burden is happening for two reasons. One, people are leave, living longer. And secondly, we are doing a much better job at identifying them earlier for individuals. So it's a combination that is stressing the fundamental infrastructures that we have today. Behind that is geographic displacement. And we often think of geographic displacement as remote outlying systems, such as we saw earlier in Antarctica, and it was extraordinarily impressive. But geographic displacement beyond remote locations also happens in our cities, because individuals close by to large hospitals may not have the access or the capability to get the care that they need. So the concept of health reaching out beyond the walls of clinics and getting to individuals no matter where they are is a fundamental necessity. But what sits behind that is an absolute need for actionable information. Now here's an interesting stat that I just learned a couple weeks ago, and I'll give you some background to it. About five years ago, I heard a stat that was produced by IBM that the amount of data in the world was doubling, doubling in its entirety every 18 months. And that was five years ago. 
The new stat is that the full amount of data in the world now is doubling every 72 days. Imagine it. Every 72 days, the entire data, farms, systems, and information that's being produced, including the social exhaust off of our own phones, is doubling the amount of available data every 72 days. So taking all this data and making it meaningful into information and then fundamentally actionable information that is utilized by an individual, by a clinician, a person at home, a caregiver, a loved one, a family member, this is the fundamental challenge that sits behind and the opportunity that sits behind digital health. Now, healthcare systems are working very hard to do adaptive capabilities to the use of information. But I will tell you, it is simply not moving fast enough. Because individuals are already turning to Dr. Google, the number one doctor in the world, to be able to get information. And over 40% are walking into their doctor's office pre-diagnosing themselves along with treatment plans, and this is before a physician or clinician has ever had a chance to have a single conversation. So there is a race going on, and that race lies fundamentally in our ability to harness and synchronize knowledge management, which is the use of that information that we are now gathering and beginning to do comparative data on. So the fact that I can access my information on my phone is fantastic. What I do with it and what others do with it now becomes the critical play. And the reality is that the systems that we are building are fundamentally based upon the concept of anomalies. With all that data floating, with all of the information that is out there establishing baselines, what we're really looking for is actionable information so that when an anomaly occurs in a person's clinical data, their lifestyle, et cetera, something is tripped at a system level that allows us to react. That reaction could be the rolling of an ambulance. It could be something as simple as a phone call to make sure that someone comes in for a blood pressure test or to check on their diabetes. But the point is, is that we're looking for those individual anomalies. And that takes us to the last piece that we have got to be thinking about. And this is fundamental, and it's not about technology. In fact, it's a little bit of the opposite. Nothing succeeds in our domain without recognizing the concepts of people, process, and then technology. The technology is probably our easiest piece. But we must redesign our systems end to end, retrain our people in workforce development in order to be able to capitalize on the use of this information and to put it to good measure. We have a significant workforce gap. Last year, the WHO estimated over 7 million positions missing in the world to fulfill the type of health care we currently deliver. And that is escalating by 2032 to 13.4 million. So the point is that we cannot continue to deliver care in the paradigm we currently have. The economics of it almost do not matter because if I could wave the magic wand, and build any hospitals I wanted and infrastructure I wanted, I still don't have the workers to execute it. So our challenge and our opportunity is going to be wrapped around this use of information. And that leads me to the very last point. And Don was kind enough to point out Graham, who works on HL7 Fire, and other standards that are out there in terms of where we are going to be grabbing information. And here's the key. If we do not absolutely focus on interoperability 
in the exchange of data and the information, then we will continue to have deeply siloed capabilities and results, and we will not be able to fulfill our fundamental mission of having that information available and flexible on a global basis so we can fill the right of each individual, no matter where they are, to have the best health possible. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. It was great. Um, and next, we have Professor John Quackenbush from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have some slides, and I don't know if they're going to come up. Ah, they did come up. Fantastic. Um, it's really an honor to be asked to talk in a session about the future of healthcare. In large part because when I look at the future of healthcare, it's what we're inventing today. And when I think about the revolutions that have occurred in science throughout history, every revolution in the history of science has been driven by one and only one thing, and that's access to data. Data are the raw materials that we use to make our discoveries, to falsify those discoveries, and to build new models to advance the state of science and lead to new theories and new discoveries. As a scientist, one of the things that's most exciting to me today is to live in a world in which we have access to unprecedented quantities of data. I began my career looking at the human genome the DNA that's in each and every one of our cells, asking what are the genes that we possess and what do those genes do? What do they tell us about our characteristics? What do they tell us about the state of our health today? And while I can generate data on everyone in this room at relatively low cost, what I can tell you based on your genome today and all the information and knowledge we have is that you should eat well, exercise, maintain a healthy weight, and not smoke. And beyond that, what we can say is you carry risks for a lot of other things, but that data in and of itself, that genome in and of itself, is not enough to really understand the state of your health or my health. That to do that, what we have to do is draw on other sources of data and information. So we can think about electronic health records as one way of grounding that genomic data and information to better understand what's encoded within it. But we recognize that health information is only a snapshot of the entire ecosystem in which we live and function. That it only gives us the, the, the most narrow view of the state of our health. We have interactions with other individuals. We have data that we can collect about the state of our health in our homes, like our weight. Um, our environmental exposure, our motion with things like mobile apps. But we also have other sources of data and information that we want to try to incorporate to learn more about the state of our health. So this is a really interesting time when we think about healthcare and advancing healthcare. We like to think about collecting data and using that data to make new discoveries. But a lot of the presentations already in this panel and that we've heard today speak to the fact that we have to take that data and information and we have to deliver it effectively. But given the fact we can capture information, we can ask the question, what can we learn from it? And if you think about all these sources of data and information, one of the things that becomes very clear is that we don't just have a big data problem, we have a messy data problem that the data is widely distributed, it's incomplete, it's fragmented, it exists in silos. And one of the greatest challenges we face is in bringing all this data together in a way that we can start to draw conclusions. But the other important thing to really recognize is when we talk about health and we talk about healthcare and healthcare delivery, we're not discussing a monolithic problem that we're trying to solve. In fact, there are many problems embedded in this system that we'd like to try to address. And it's represented by the various stakeholders that we think about. The patient, of course, is the center of this universe, but the patient can't necessarily interpret all of that data. That patient needs a clinician. 
the clinician needs to rely on the laboratories that are generating the data within his or her hospital. And we also want to think about the research environment that's going to draw on this data to make the next generation of discoveries and the next generation of recommendations. So we have to think about this ecosystem, and as we think about just collecting data, that data as a monolithic entity is not going to be enough to address these questions unless we put the questions and the data in the context of each one of the stakeholders who wants to take advantage of it. The big advantage we have today, and again, a number of speakers have addressed this, is we have access to high-performance computing resources that even five years ago were virtually unheard of. So our challenge is to look at this ecosystem and to understand the questions that we're going to ask and the specific information we want to collect and how we want to deliver it taking advantage of mobile health technologies and cloud computing. To do this, we have to think broadly about data. And in the US, the National Research Council of the National Academies commissioned a study that's been really fundamental to the thinking that I've been doing about the state of health and how we manage health data. They published a study called Frontiers of Massive Data Analysis. And in this study, they point out the fact that the challenges associated with massive data go far beyond the technological aspects of data management, data storage, data security. In fact, what they point out in this study is that the key element in meeting big data's challenge, challenges is the development of rigorous quantitative and statistical methods. That we need to make an investment for the future of healthcare in developing new methods. That we can't just imagine that putting data into a pot and stirring it through machine learning or other methods is going to deliver the results unless we make an investment to understand that the methods we're using are robust, reproducible, and reliable. And this report goes on to, to really emphasize that without making this investment in new methodology, it's quite possible to turn data into something resembling knowledge when it actually is not and that uh, taking a cautionary note, overlooking this foundation may yield results that are at best not useful or at worst harmful. So we really need to think carefully before we leap into applying a lot of methods about how we're gonna take those methods, how we're gonna develop them, how we're gonna validate them. Nevertheless, having access to this data opens up some unprecedented opportunities in spite of the challenges. A lot of the medical research that we're talking about and thinking about and wanting to do when I hear about these massive quantities of data we have available. This morning I heard uh, data about 120 million mothers and data about their infants, their children. That kind of data is absolutely rich in possibility to take that data and information and learn things. But the challenge we face is we learn things in looking at those populations when we want to actually deliver medical care to each one of those mothers, we have to understand that they are an individual within a population and that their unique situations are going to differentiate them from what's happening on average. So we need to come up with good ways of taking that data and information and learning things from it, but then delivering it at the point of care to the physician who's going to act on it so that they can understand the strengths and limitations of what we learn at a population level. When we look at trying to learn data at a population level, we have to understand that the data we have is often incomplete, and that, as I mentioned before, it's often messy. That it doesn't necessarily reflect the entire status and state of that individual, but gives us a snapshot into what's happening with them. And the importance of getting the physician involved is that he or she can help us get around that problem of incomplete data and information by interacting directly with the patients to fill in the blanks in ways that algorithms and tools and computational methods quite simply can't. Because biological systems like us are complex. Not only are healthcare delivery systems complex, but the individuals we're trying to treat and care for are themselves complex. And we have to be able to account for and adapt for that biological complexity. 
So what we need to think about in developing the future of healthcare is to prioritize. We need to use the right tools to solve the right problems, and we need to think carefully about delivering results in the right form to the right people. Data themselves are not the solution. They're the foundation on which we're going to build the solution, and we're going to build the future for the healthcare in India, in the United States, in every country in the world. That data is the raw material for driving this revolution, and that we as responsible stewards of data are in a unique position today to help ensure that our children and grandchildren will live in a better, healthier world, driven by the things that we can learn from collecting, managing, analyzing, interpreting, and effectively delivering data and information. So thank you. Uh, Professor Quackenbush, thank you very much. That was uh, wonderful. You know, a lot of times when students or other folks ask me, you know, how do I get at that? I remind them what I think is under Dr. Quackenbush's thought process, which is to think about the algorithms, to be smart about what you're computing, um, and to really think about the underlying math and, and the, how that data flows together. Our next speaker is Professor Kazim Rahimi, who's the director of the Oxford Martin Program on Deep Medicine in the United Kingdom. I think we're covering uh, quite a few continents here this morning. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Also, had some slides while we're waiting for the slides to come up. As someone has said, it is uh, difficult to predict, in particular, the future. So, with that disclaimer, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm not claiming to know exactly how our future healthcare might look like, but I'd like to share some of our experience with using large electronic healthcare data and digital technologies uh, in our research, and at the end, also. Um, flag some of the challenges that I see with digital innovation um, to hopefully um, inform the subsequent debate. I mean, as scientists, one of the great assets that we see in digital revolution um, is the power that it offers us to accelerate scientific discoveries at a scale that has never been possible before. Just given an example from my own area, common cardiovascular disease, heart valve conditions. If today one of your relatives as old age is diagnosed to have a common valvular disease and is seen by the best experts in the world, Dr. Shetty, let's say, cardiovascular experts, and saying, well, is there anything that I could have done to prevent this from happening? It's very likely that the answer to that question is no. These are degenerative conditions, disease of aging, and at the moment we have no knowledge of knowing how to prevent them. But let's see what happens if you use routine electronic healthcare data from about four or five million people who have been seen by the primary care doctors and specialists over years, on average for about 10 years. And you look at things that doctors routinely collect. Suddenly a picture emerges that elevated blood pressure, so far an unknown risk factor for a common valvular disease, is a strong risk factor for such a disease. Not only that, the sheer scale of the data enables us to go much deeper. We can stratify patients by different age groups, by their sex, by the body mass index, by other habits that they have, to just be much more precise about the extent of the risk that each of those groups of individuals are being exposed to. So this is an example that shows that I believe the term degenerative conditions, and there are many other conditions from dementia, osteoarthritis, and so on, soon is gonna be at least partially explicable through the analysis of large-scale data. Another example that we see is how those data can help us with population health management. One of the key questions for many healthcare providers across the world, for instance, is how to predict who is likely to be admitted to the hospital with the idea that if we were able to, able to identify those people, we would be able to pro probably provide care outside of the hosp hospital setting to prevent the costly hospital admission uh, for those patients. So far, the, the tools of being able to predict that um, have been limited. But let's see what happens again if you use data from five million people tracked over several years and apply machine learning methods to predict the risk of people being admitted to the hospital. 
suddenly we see that we can come up with a model with relatively good predictive ability to discriminate between those who are likely to be admitted to hospital and not. Not only that, that tool is also much better than any conventional statistical method of being stable over time. For instance, whether you're interested in predicting the risk of population that you're um, looking after within the next few months or the next few years, those models have got very loss in the predictive ability over time. So these examples are just examples of using structured medical records data um, that are routinely collected um, by physicians in hospitals. But as was seen, said by the previous speaker, obviously we are at the time where the amount of data that is being collected um, through the formal healthcare system is being rapidly eclipsed by the amount of data through other sources, whether these are sensors or whether they're, they're coming from um, Internet of Things, it's clear that the information about our behavior and our environment are likely to be a great determinant of our health. And that opens up uh, the opportunities for us to understand diseases, discovering new treatments, and providing better care for smaller groups of individuals at the time as they need it. The challenge that obviously that new knowledge generates is how do you bring it to, the, to those who need it? I mean, it was mentioned before, we have an implementation challenge here. And the question is how to get there. And again, digital technologies can help here. Given the power of being able to automate um, as well as simplify things that currently are hugely hum labor intensive. And one example of our own work is developing tools for a complex medical condition, heart failure, to bring the knowledge to non-specialists um, and adding at the same time capacity to the healthcare system. The model looks like something like this, that elderly people who are not naturally um, tech savvy um, can monitor the health condition in their home environment. That data is being automatically sent not to the physicians who are already overburdened in managing the condition of the patients that they're seeing the to date practice, but to a central unit um, that filters that information and has also access to patients' electronic me medical records as well as knowledge of the best scientific um, evidence and can combine that information to provide advice to the patients and also stratify when patients need to actually see the doctor. From patients' perspective, it is, we know, that is a great experience. They can access the healthcare data. They can learn about the conditions if they wish, and they can learn about the treatment if they wish. Um, they can engage with that central unit at any time that they like, um, whether this is through um, online messaging or through uh, other uh, forms of um, communication. So a few examples of you know, what is achievable, but let's go back and step back saying how are those technologies helping us achieve our health system goals? There are different ways of framing what any health system wants to achieve. This is one way of me summarizing our overarching goals. Certainly it is clear that as any healthcare system, we are interested in providing the best care for the population that we are looking after. Not only that, we're also interested at an individual level, making the interaction of individuals with the health system as humane as possible so that they have excellent quality of life and a positive experience. At the same time, we want to make sure that the cost of healthcare are contained. And as the UN SDG mantra says, we don't want to leave anyone behind. So equity is a key central role in most healthcare system planning. So what I've said so far flags that there are clearly immense opportunities on the two, two top goals, improving health and also improving patient experiences of interacting with the healthcare system. Where I'm less clear or less positive is how leaving the market on its own, we're gonna achieve the latter two. And I think this is where as a community, we need to just think a bit harder. And I think there's sometimes some misconceptions about you know, cost reduction and equity. To just give an example, I mean, Denmark, I don't know if anyone in the audience is from Denmark, small country of about 10 million population, but it is a model country of digital transformation in health. They have started much earlier than many other countries, and it's said that over the past few years, they have actually managed to, to go the journey that many other countries want to go. The number of hospitals have been almost halved, shifting the care from hospital to primary care. But when we look at the healthcare expenditure, per capita expenditure in Denmark over the past 20 years, certainly I don't see any evidence of the cost for healthcare going down. And if you compare it to the cost in the Western Europe, the pattern is very similar, where there are several other countries who are lagging far behind in digitization. And I think the reason for that is that sometimes we confuse efficiency with cost reduction. 
Digital technologies are great tools of reducing the unit cost of interaction with healthcare physicians. But as we reduce the unit cost, we also increase the volume, the demand for the healthcare. There is no ceiling for that. And by, that, by doing that, the overall expenditure will go up. That is not unique to healthcare. I mean, that is what we see in any other sector of economy. By making computer cheaper from big IBM machines to small smartphones, the overall expenditure will go up. And that is something that we need to just be mindful of. Um, so that we can be prepared for it and be aware of who's going to pay for it. There are other challenges, and we can, we can discuss that, and some of us was mentioned before, but in this fast-paced area, I mean, there are issues about transparency, um, there are issues about regulation and governance, um, and in terms of information flow, is the question of controlling that information flow uh, for, um, the, for the public good. And I've said earlier, there seems to be an inherent conflicting um, goals in terms of equity versus economic growth, essential care versus best care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Himi. Our final uh, panelist is Professor Sunil Agrawal, who's the director of the Robotics uh, and Rehabilitation Laboratory at Columbia University in New York.